So I think we're probably going to have a few more people joining, but I just want to make sure that we have enough time now that I pressured Amber to do like 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Uh, so hello, everyone, and welcome to the A11 Global Collective. I can't believe it's October already. Uh, and I do see some new names. So welcome, new, new member. Feel free to use the chat to introduce yourselves. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Tamar. I'm going to start with a quick visual description. I'm white. I have a long brown hair. I'm wearing a gray shirt and a black sweater on. Uh, I have a large headset on. And behind me is a, kind of like a light green wall of my home office in uh, Palo Alto. Before I introduce our guest speaker, just a couple of things to mention. This session will be recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel for the next um, two or three months. Uh, captions are available during this presentation and you can turn the captions on by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of the screen. Um, it's possible to change size, font and color um, and, and place on the screen, just FYI. Uh, this is meant to be a conversation, so opportunity for us to learn and ask questions. Uh, so please make yourself comfortable to feel uncomfortable. Uh, and Amber is here to lead the conversation. October is very busy month in, month in terms of disability awareness. This month, we celebrated Down Syndrome Awareness Day, National Disability Employment Awareness, Dyslexia Awareness. So I couldn't think of a better time or better month uh, to talk about testing website for accessibility. I'm really excited to have Amber here with me today. Uh, Amber is the founder and CEO of Equalize Digital, and today she'll show us how to test websites for accessibility, both with automated tools and manual, uh, manually with the keyboard and screen reader. Uh, without further ado, I'll pass it on to you, Amber. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. Let me share my screen. And you can see I got to share my whole desktop with sound. All right, make this a little bit bigger. Oh, maybe. Okay, so I'm going to start with a presentation. I won't really introduce myself. I'm happy to answer questions about my background and all that later, but I want really want to get into the meat of why we're here. Um, I'm going to do a combination of going through some slides and giving some background information, and then I'm actually going to do a live testing demo and show you what we would do um, to test a website. So just to start and give you an overview of what our testing process is, um, we do accessibility audits, um, and then we also do custom website design and development at my organization. And so this is our process, either if we're doing an audit or if we are actually auditing something that we have built before we launch it to production. So the first thing is we run an automated scanning tool in bulk to check for obvious accessibility problems. And I'll test a little, I'll talk a little bit more about why we use automated scanning tools in just a little bit. Uh, the second thing is then we will manually test a representative sample of every type of page that we have. So if it's a home page, if we have archive pages and single pages. So what I mean by that is let's say on a blog, you have your main blog homepage where you can see the list of all the different blog posts or some number of them that have been published. That's an archive page. And then you can click into one of them or navigate into one of them and you get the individual full blog post. That's a single page. Um, so we would do that for every different uh, piece of content that we have that is unique. So we typically are working in the WordPress land. So that means if you've got a team's custom post type, if you have products on your website, then we're looking at the single product page and the main shop page that shows all the products. So basically any kind like that. And then any pages with specialized features or functionality. So pages with advanced search and filters, pages with navigation um, that is in interior page navigation to jump down to a different section, pages with embeds or maps, uh, pages with forms, any page that is important to the user journey and being able to complete a conversion action on the website, those all need to be manually tested. And then um, we do our manual testing. First, we'll run through the page with the keyboard only. Then we will run through it with a screen reader 
or two. We actually tend to, we use multiple um, and, and we'll do different browsers as well. But that's sort of, we do our keyboard pass first, then we do screen reader passes. And then we also test as part of this with the website Zoom to at least 200%. And the reason why you do this is because um, one, there's a, a web content accessibility guideline requirement that websites have to work and still be functional and readable at 200%, but it's really to help people who are low vision because a lot of people who are um, low vision but not fully blind may zoom in on the website uh, or have their default zoom in their browser settings super zoomed in. And so we really wanna make sure that if that's the case that they can engage with it. So we're engaging with it normally, we're engaging with it in multiple browsers and with screen readers, and we're engaging with it in a, a zoomed in state. And then we, after we have done those things and while we're doing those things, we compile a list of these are all the problems that we think need to be fixed. So then we resolve all of those issues. And then that is when we'll bring in as part of our testing process, um, native screen reader users or other users with disabilities. So it, it might be someone with a cognitive disorder or it might be someone we don't normally think of as disabled, but like someone who's elderly that is going to be using the website for more of usability testing. Um, so we like to do that after we've done our initial passes to really go through an audit just because I don't really need a screen reader user spending their time telling me this image is missing an alt tag when I can find that automatically, right? Like we really wanna bring in users for testing at the phase when um, we think the website is ready and we want to confirm that the user journey works and makes sense and there are no problems. Um, so that hopefully they are really only finding very minor things um, and not major or huge lists of problems. So that's what our process is. I think it will make a lot more sense when I'm actually doing the demo, but I wanted to start out with this. And then what I wanna talk about is what we're looking for when we're doing all of these things. Um, I'm happy to pop the slides, a link to these slides in. There's gonna be a lot of information here and we're gonna sort of fly through it because I really wanna spend the meat of the time showing you how I do a test. But I think it's important to provide sort of a background on what we're looking for. Um, I'm not going to represent that everything in these slides is 100% comprehensive list. It's I tried to be as thorough as possible, um, but really ideally the best way to get familiar with that if you're trying to figure out how to test things is as, as frustrating or like boring as it might sound to go like read web content accessibility guidelines 2.1, but that is where we go. It's we really wanna read those almost memorize them if you can, be super familiar with them. Um, but basically what I have on the screen here is four general things um, that we're looking for in, in different sections. So the first one is we look for issues that are related to design. The second is re issues related to code. The third is issues related to content. And then the fourth, it just generally is, you wanna look for anything that sounds or looks strange or confusing. Um, and just always be thinking that as you're testing. So I'm gonna start by explaining some of the accessibility in design and the things that we might look for that relate to the design. So I have on this slide a list of items. I'm just gonna sort of read through them and, um, and I'm gonna do that for the design and for code and content, just so you have some background information and then we'll actually go into live test and talk about what this means on an actual website. Um, so accessibility and design, things we're looking for. First is uses readable font and accessible colors. I have something that shows accessible colors in just a minute, but readable fonts, we really want to see that it's not, it's a little bit of sizing. It's also how it's styled. So there can be cursive or handwritten fonts, which you don't typically see on business websites, but sometimes like bloggers might want to use those or uh, a personal, um, you know, like a, a personality, especially women, sometimes we see this authors um, or something like that might want a handwritten font. Well, is this really a legible font? But also there are, if there's a whole bunch we could, you know, you could get into if you wanted to read about like typography and legible fonts, but making sure that some letters 
um, don't blend into each other. So like an R next to an N, can you tell obviously that it's an R next to an N or does it look like an M? Because, um, and sometimes with uh, serif fonts, that's common. So we're sort of looking for those things. Um, we wanna make sure that the design works on multiple screen sizes, devices, and orientations. So I always think, I always use my phone in vertical to look at a website. I don't know why anyone would turn it sideways. And then I went and visited my dad and my dad's like turning it sideways and he's trying to navigate this website. And I was like, how do you even read anything on that, right? So people do things that you don't expect. Um, so you really wanna make sure that, that the design works no matter what device they're on. Um, and how they're using that device. We look for things, issues related to proximity. So related elements need to be close to one another. So a label for a form has to be really close to the field so that you know if the screen gets wider and you have them next to each other instead of one on top, you don't want them to spread out, which makes someone have to track with their eyes to figure out which label goes with which field, right? We really wanna make sure that things that are related to one another stay close together. Um, we look for visible labels for all fields and clear required indicators um, for any required fields, not placeholder text. You can have placeholder text, but you still have to have labels above the field. Uh, we look for hover, focus, and error states, make sure that they're there and visible. Uh, we're checking to make sure color alone isn't used to convey important information. So if it's a graph, is there a pattern on the bar charts instead of just colors? So that it's easier for somebody who maybe is colorblind, they can't read the key and map based on colors. Um, so we're looking for that, that kind of things. Um, there's no images of text. I've seen this where designers have designed websites and they make this cool headline, like, I don't know, 1990s word art from Microsoft Office and, and that's the headline. And so the, the developer was just like, uh, I can't code this with CSS. I'm just gonna make it an image and insert it in, right? And we're just like, uh, no. <laughs> uh, so we wanna make sure all text is text, no images of text. Um, and then as we move through the website, we're looking for consistent heading styles across pages. So is it kind of obvious visually when you look at something, what an H2 is, what an H3 is, H4 and so on. Then other things we're looking for is ideally we want to see sentence case for readability. I think it's fine to do title case in um, headlines, but all caps can be really challenging for people. And sometimes some screen readers will interpret all caps as something they have to spell out, like an acronym, <laughs> um, even a very long word, rather than trying to pronounce it. So we're really looking for a sentence case in almost all cases. Uh, links have to have underline if they're in like bodies of text or be obviously denoted as a link. Um, and, and the best way to do that is underlines. So we're looking for that. Consistent navigation throughout the site. Are the navigation menus the same or do you get to one page and suddenly it's totally different? That can be really disorienting for people. Multiple ways of navigating the site. So that could be having a list of related pages in a sidebar, having this sitemap in the footer, having a search bar available. Um, I didn't list this here, but breadcrumbs, showing visible breadcrumbs on the page. So we really wanna see, have there been ways designed that help people move through the site in different ways? If one way, like the main navigation doesn't work for them, do they have a fallback? Um, ideally, we wanna see no pop-ups, no text that is only visible on hover, no excessive use of carousels or accordions. Um, if they are there, they need to be accessible and we'll talk about that. We can talk about that more. Uh, we don't wanna see parallax, which parallax is an effect where there's like an image typically in the background behind an element. And as you scroll, the image stays fixed and the next element comes up and goes over it and whatever is there sort of moves, but it stays fixed. This can be really disorienting for people. Um, with um, certain cognitive disorders or traumatic brain injuries, um, or if they have certain visual issues, it can actually cause them to be nauseous or dizzy. Uh, so we recommend against that. We try to, if there's background videos in the design, we're looking for that and we're being like, hey, you probably shouldn't have a background video. Um, so those are some things related to design that we're looking for. 
This is my example on colors and I'll show you a colorblind plugin that I like to use for Chrome that's super handy. Uh, but this is a screenshot that I have on the screen from uh, Adobe has an accessible color palette generator. And basically what this screenshot shows is there are um, four or sorry, five columns labeled A, B, C, D, and E. And the first two columns is a darker and a lighter blue. And then the next two columns are a darker and a lighter red. And then the third column is a yellow. And these across the top are the colors from this particular website's color palette. And it has the hex codes below it. And then there are three more rows that have each of these columns, but it's simulated um, different forms of color blindness and what this color palette would look like to those people with um, those forms of color blindness. And so you really want to make sure that your colors are still significantly different from one another, uh, even if someone cannot see all waves of light for color. So this is an example of that. So then we also, as we're assessing, we're looking at some things in the code. Um, the first thing is we want to see skip links or the first focusable element. I'll provide an example of what those are in just a minute when we audit, but basically they are um, something that allows someone to move away from the navigation and get quickly into the content without having to tab through or read through many items in the navigation menu. Uh, we are looking to make sure that screen reader text is present on any ambiguous links or text content that wouldn't make sense on its own. Um, so this could be links or buttons. This could also be things like if you have struck out um, text with the strike through feature, this doesn't actually get read by a screen reader. And so you would need to actually add hidden screen reader text to add context to that. So they would know that it was struck out. Otherwise it would just read it as if it was normal text on the page. Uh, we want to ensure that all controls and links can be accessed by the keyboard only. We want to make sure that anything that behaves as a button or links are using button input or a tags not divs. <laughs> Sometimes in older websites, it becomes a major thing to have to recode everything. It was divs. So it might be the case that there's ARIA added to those divs to make them accessible, which is not ideal, but it, but it is better than obviously not. Um, but ideally, we're looking to make sure that elements that are supposed to be interactive are actually coded using proper HTML semantics. And along that line, we're also looking to make sure that there's proper landmarks, either via semantic HTML or uh, landmark roles that have been assigned to describe the structural landmarks on the page. So things like banner for the top, main for the main, um, complementary sections, navigation, all of that. And then we want to make sure that also in the code, all form inputs must have explicitly associated label elements. So I mentioned before in the design, we want to make sure that there's visible labels above each field. Well, they actually have to be tagged as labels and connected. I've seen instances where somebody typed it in because they knew it was supposed to be there, but it wasn't actually connected to that. So for a screen reader user, it didn't read out a label to the field and it didn't know what the field was for. Um, so we are also sort of looking at code a lot of times too. You don't have to be a developer in order to do this, but you do need to get some level of comfort with HTML code and being able to look at it and sort of assess and figure out what's happening. Um, and then, and then as I mentioned, like screen reader text. So if there's any ambiguous links. Uh, so for example, I have an image up on the screen right now that is from a, a portal. So it's not actually a public facing website where someone can apply for um, services, workforce services, and um, and on this there's applications and there you can there's a section that says my applications and processes. There's a subheading that says choices recipient onboarding. There's a little uh, scale that says it's 50% complete, and then below that there's a button that that visually says finish and submit. 
Then there's a dividing line. There's another subheading. This one says choices employment notification form. We can see that it is 0% complete. And it also has a button that says finish and submit. And so we need to look at this code and ensure that um, there's actual context on this so that it would say finish and submit choices recipient onboarding application, finish and submit choices employment notification form, those sorts of things. So that um, even if visually we don't want to add all that extra context to the link or button, it's still there in the code and reads out to people. And then the third thing we're looking at is stuff related to content. And what I have in this list related to content is we're looking for headings are present in long documents. They're used in the correct order. So this is like going all the way back to high school and we had to write outlines, right? And we had to have, you know, this, this was the I and then there was a number one and then under that you'd have the A, right? So headings are the same way. You have one heading one on a page and then you might have multiple heading twos. And then if you need to have subtopics under that, you might add heading three. So it might say heading two, heading three, heading three, and then heading two, right? But we wanna make sure that we don't have any random, like, oh, I just picked the heading six because I liked the style that it was, right? That one was blue instead of green. Um, so, so we're looking for that. Um, underline, I've mentioned before that we expect links to be underlined. We expect, the underline is never used in any other context. Um, so we don't ever want to see content that is underlined for emphasis because this can be really confusing. Most people expect links uh, to be underlined. And so they will try and click on your underlined for emphasis text thinking that it is link. We don't want to see any content that's typed out in all capital letters. So again, this could be a design item like we talked about where it's coming in and being introduced by the CSS code on the website. Or it, it literally, I've seen this before, where people just turn on their caps lock and they type a whole phrase out. Um, so, so sometimes it has to be fixed in the code. Sometimes it has to be fixed in the content. Um, we're looking again for meaningful link anchor text. So outside of the buttons and maybe other elements that are coded into the website, we're looking for just in the middle of a paragraph, if somebody said, you know, click here to, to contact us and they've only linked the words click here that has no meaning to someone on a screen reader who doesn't have the surrounding context of the rest of that sentence if they're just listening to all the links on the page. So we're looking for that in our body content as well. We wanna make sure that content is properly formatted in lists as applicable to make it easier to read and scan. Um, and then also for people on screen readers so that it will connect and they can hear, oh, there's gonna be five items coming and I'm gonna listen to them in that order. Um, any sort of tabular data needs to be actually put into tables with appropriate heading. Uh, and then tables or alternate content is provided for complex graphics. So if you have graphs or charts, um, you know, provide tables of that data or provide a very verbose written description that explains what this is a graph of and all of the information that can be found in it so that someone who cannot see the visual doesn't lose out on that information. Also in content, we're looking, we check every video. Uh, not just do they have captions, but are they accurate and are they well-timed? We want all videos and all audio files to also have transcripts available for them. So if someone does not want to watch the video and read the captions, they can just read the transcripts. But this is also important for somebody, for example, who is deafblind and is using a refreshable braille display, they won't be able to play a video and read the captions or get that content out. So you really need to have the transcript available for them. And then we might look at, do videos have optional, do they have descriptive narration so that they make sense if you're only hearing the audio? So if you can't see the video, can somebody who is listening to it still get all the information that they need? We check, so this is where it gets extra fun and sometimes frustrating for clients, but 
website accessibility goes beyond the HTML pages on your website. It also goes to all of the files that you link and share. So are your PDF files or your Word docs accessible? Um, your Google Slides, if you link to a slideshow, you can put alt text on those images in Google Slides, right? Like, have you, have you done that? Uh, then we're generally looking for an avoidance of use of GIFs and memes we tend to caution against or we think really carefully about embedding content from social media or other third party sources because embedded content is a lot less likely to be accessible. Um, or it could present a problem if it's in like an untitled iframe or something like that. Uh, content, we want to make sure the content reading level is appropriate for the audience. And do the images have proper alternative text. So there's a huge list and I don't expect everyone to have memorized that, but these are kind of the things that I have that are going through my mind as I am getting ready to test and as I'm interacting with pages. Um, and I think a little bit, it's just, you know, as you do more and more, you start to figure that out. Um, so I wanna take a step back uh, and talk, actually, let me go back for a second. I want to talk about why we start with automated scans and then I'll do the demo, but I want to see, does anyone have any questions about any of these items that I've talked about? I know I like didn't go really in depth on why for all of them, but I'm happy to answer anything else on that front. I totally can't see the chat, by the way. I can open it up. Let me see. <laughs> so feel free to unmute as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so Marcos, I think, said, I don't understand the third statement, proximity. Oh, never mind. And then you said you understood it after I explained it. So, okay. Yep. Hi. I had a quick question, actually. Um, you talked about, like, if it was, like, a legacy website, maybe, and it might be difficult to, like, update everything to accessibility guidelines. Like, what do you do in those instances? Just wondering. So, it really depends. It depends on a variety of things. Um, Ideally, and typically when we're working with someone, everything, so everything can be made accessible. It's just some require a lot more work and some require so much work that it is actually less expensive to start new. Um, so in those instances, we would, you know, we might actually explore, are we just going to rebuild this? Because there's so much here that by the time you rebuild it, you might as well have also gotten a new design at the same time, which maybe will help you with your conversion optimization in other ways, right? Um, I think yes. I think the other thing too that sometimes comes into play, particularly in WordPress, which is where we work, is that um, a lot of websites that we encounter are just using third-party plugins. Some are free from WordPress.org, some are premium that they've purchased. But sometimes those many times those add accessibility problems. And so then you have to sort of be like, do we go to this developer or see if they will fix it? Do we need to build this whole functionality ourselves because we've looked and there is no accessible option for this functionality? Um, or sometimes there's a discussion about like, is this actually needed? I know that's something we've seen, particularly with our university clients, like I'm seeing a trend now where they're blocking anyone from even being able to upload PDFs. So faculty can't just go on the website and upload a PDF because the PDF is almost always going to be not accessible if it's a random one that they just made themselves um, and haven't had tested. And so then there's really a conversation like, do you actually need this or could this be a web page instead of a PDF? Um, and I think when you have older websites, that's like that conversation comes into play too. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. I was curious about the um, thing you were mentioning earlier on around uh, the, uh, bringing in screen reader users around when the website is like ready. Um, I'm mm -hmm. curious if there have been instances where like the design is intent or made in such a way that it just wasn't really, I mean, like, I mean, typically when a website's ready, it's going to be like kind of during a QA phase. So that's um, like sometimes a couple of weeks before they're going to go live or launch it. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious yeah. if you've had instances where they say, oh, it's more of a design thing and it's going to take more than a couple of weeks. 
So we haven't really found anything with a user testing process where it is a design thing that takes a long time. I think most, most things that really require like redesign with a designer and a whole new like design phase, we do, we find those and like during our design phases, if we're designing something like we have whole accessibility passes before we even show it to the client because we don't want to show the client something they're going to get attached to and then be like, oh, wait, that's not accessible, right? Um, so I feel like that doesn't come up. I think where we see users where it does require is sometimes we have instances where the navigation structure needs to be reworked or rediscussed because you know, when we do user testing and I have, I'm happy to share a link. I gave a whole presentation on how we do user testing. It's like an hour long at um, a different meetup. And I have a recording for that if anyone's interested, but like sometimes you're really asking them to do like a journey or a flow and you're asking them to like, like get information about this, but you're not telling them how to do it. Right. So it's, it's also on the usability side. Um, and so sometimes it's like they, they had no idea how to find this information or where to even go on the website to get it. Uh, so clearly that means that there's a problem in the navigation structure or like something or, hey, the search bar should really be up on the top. So it's like one of the first things they can encounter rather than way down at the bottom. So sometimes those are design changes, but they're usually minor enough. And at least in WordPress, like, like changing your navigation is super fast and easy. So it, I haven't, we haven't really encountered anything where um, it's taken a long time on the design front. Sometimes we've encountered things where it needs more content or more explanation. Um, and, and then it's like, you know, like with software or that portal I showed, right? It really determined that we need to actually have a video, an onboarding video when someone enters it that explains what is happening and what they have to do and, you know, how they use the software. So then it's like, okay, well now our team, not us, but like the client has to go create that video. So that sometimes can delay things, so. Awesome, yeah, I appreciate that. I was just curious if you maybe found value at times of uh, like a screen user being involved in like the UX design phase, if there's like a um, some type of interaction that might not be so, standard or something. Yeah, we we haven't and own and and I'll be one hundred percent transparent. We use so we use Sketch to do all of our web designs, and I'm not certain how how um, like I'm not certain how accessible a Sketch file would be because we haven't ever done that. So I'm not even certain how we would have and and frequently with clients we're giving them like a sometimes it's even just a PNG, sometimes it's a PDF of the designed website. I'm not certain how a screen reader user would engage with that in the same way. I'm not right, saying it's you. not possible, I just don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Um, so let me move on and then I'm happy to ask some more. So, so circling back and, and then I'll do a live demo. Um, why do we start with automated scans? So many of you, probably all of you, because this is an accessibility meetup, know that automated software can catch anywhere, depending upon who you ask and which scanning company, anywhere between like 35 and if you're at your DQ and you have ax, they say 50% of problems, right? So manual testing has to be done. Uh, an, an automated scan is not the, like, the only thing you can do. However, automated scans can speed up identification of many problems in bulk and rapidly provide a full site assessment at at least a minimal level. So we really don't like to waste auditor or user testing time identifying and reporting on problems that can be easily identified with an automated tool. This means that nobody has to go check 500 pages on a website and click a button you know, even like you could run it through Wave, right? And it would tell you how many images are missing alt text, although they mark that as a feature now, which <laughs> can be confusing. But right, like that requires somebody to go do that for 500 pages and then somebody has to write them all down and then go like, right? Why would we do that when we can run a scan and we can quickly see, oh, these are all the pages missing alt text. And then we can just go assign the content person and say, hey, you need to go 
either assess all these images and say, nope, they're decorative, they don't need alt text, or you need to add it. Um, so really that allows you to move faster and save time equals save cost. Uh, I have a couple of bulk scanning tools listed on this slide. Uh, one is Accessibility Checker, which I'm gonna show you. It's our WordPress plugin. Uh, Monsito, if we have time, I can also show you that because we pay for and use that on non-WordPress websites. Um, Pope Tech is one that uses the WAVE API. So it's all of WAVE's rules. And then Site Improve is another one that is more like Monsito. The two of them are, they use their own rule set. Um, but all of these tools here do bulk scanning of the entire site and will give you a quick at a glance on specific rules that can be found with automated testing. So I am going to close out and I'm going to quickly show you um, what we do to do some testing on a website. So if we, if we have a website that's either ours or it's a new one that's coming in for an audit, the first thing that we do is we do the automated scan, as I mentioned. It's either going to be, if it's a WordPress website, we're using our accessibility checker plugin that we developed. And if it is not a WordPress website, then we use Monsito. Um, and basically what, what this does is a couple things. I'm gonna, sorry, I'm trying to figure out where to put like my videos of everybody <laughs> so I can still see everything. All right. Um, and so, so real fast, how this looks on a, on a WordPress website with our scanning is we have a couple of different things. We can see if we go, for example, to pages, and this is a, like, it's a fake demo site with fake content and, or we've inserted some problems intentionally onto the site for testing purposes. Um, but we can get a quick glance if we go to pages, I can see this about page right here has um, 21 errors, 11 color contrast issues, three things that we think are warnings or that require assessment. On this particular page, there have been four things that we've ignored. Um, and so it has a total score of maybe about 78%. So we could see this for every page at a glance. Um, with those automated issues. We also will do when we run the scan, there's a section where we can go to open issues. And this, this is the same, Monsito has the same interface and I'm happy to show you that as well. Um, and I can see individual issues. So on this particular, this is a uh, post, the post title because we were making issues is GIFs, animated and not animated. And there's a broken, skip or anchor link. This is the particular code that it is. Um, so I could go to that post and fix it or by clicking edit, I could view the front end or I could be like, hey, no, this is actually, this works. Of course it doesn't, but I could say, and I want to ignore it. So this would show us everything on the entire site. So we know that there's 1,587 unique issues identified on this site. But what's important to note is that they're not actually unique. That's the total issues. But if you have something in your header that shows up on every page and you have uh, 30 pages on your website, then it's going to log us 30 issues. So we have a fast track feature that allows you to see sorted by the number of pages and the number of checks that it has failed. So for example, this unique snippet of code, which is a link that's a fake link, and it's on an image. So I've got an HTML image tag here, and I can sort of see this is the source of my image and what the file name is is sometimes helpful. So it's ATTAB logo white.png, and there's where an alt text would be, right? And it's a linked image. It's on, I have a column that shows me the number of affected pages. So this one is on 49 pages, failing checks three. So I could click this open and I could see, we've been sort of playing around with some features, but I could then see the specific checks. There's a new table that becomes visible. So this particular one is flagging a linked image has empty alternative text. It also flags an empty link because it's basically the same thing, but we're flagging it multiple times. And then um, 
It also flags as a broken skip or anchor link because for us, when anything has just a hashtag, we're thinking that that is supposed to be an anchor link somewhere on the page. Um, obviously, in this instance, this is a demo site, it's not a real website. So um, this would tell us, oh, hey, this is a broken link that during development, there was a placeholder, they just stuck the link there because they didn't actually know where it was supposed to go. <laughs> and then we would say, oops, we need to go to this page and put a real link in here because this won't actually do anything if someone tries to click it. Um, but what's handy about doing, again, the automated scans is you can find items that if we fix this one thing, we fix this link and we add correct alternative text to this image, it's going to resolve three issues on 49 pages. So that right there, I'm really bad at fast math, right? 49 pages, the other one is on 19. Um, but basically it's around a hundred of our, um, our individual 1500 issues that we saw. And you can actually see here that there's actually only 320 unique items that need to be assessed. So, so this is really why like an automated scanning thing can be helpful because it can also help you prioritize how, what you need to fix and where, rather than having to go page by page, you can see what is maybe having the biggest impact across the entire site. Um, and so our workflow is, is if it's WordPress site, we use this. If it's not WordPress site, we set it up with Monsito and it does a scan, which is very similar to this. And we'll go through, um, and we'll look at the fast track and we'll try to de determine, is this actually a problem? And if it's not, so in this example, on our broken skipper anchor link, we've pretended, we've, we put a global ignore on it. So we've actually said, nope, this isn't broken, it works. Of course, right, this is just for testing, it really would be a problem, but, um, and so we've marked this as a, a uh, as a global ignore, which means anytime it sees this on any page, don't list it as a problem because it's been manually assessed and determined whether or not it is. So we like to do this where we go through and find things that impact the entire site. And then I mentioned that we will go through an individual page by page basis. So this is, so this is what this website looks like on the front. Um, it is a website for a fake roofing company. This is just like a demo theme that we randomly chose and put on. Um, the logo is that image that we were talking about. So the A-T-T-A-B with a little roof carrot to the top. Uh, it has a navigation menu with, um, with uh, sorry, six different elements in it. Home, about us, services, projects, contact us, get a free estimate. And then there's a hero section with some buttons in it. There is a section that has some text about it and a, a form, and then some other sections that are call outs to learn more about different services, a section that explains why you would choose this company, some different numbers, a client, client testimonial. So this is generally what this website looks like in the different sections that exist on the homepage. So, if we are visiting the single page for this, we can also see in the editor, the problems that exist in a summary. So we can see this particular page has 80% pass test. We never say accessible because again, automated testing tools can't um, detect everything. So even if you had 100% on your past test, it doesn't mean that it's successful. There could still be problems. So you really have to keep that in mind if you're using an automated tool. And then we can see there's 18 errors, 17 contrast errors, 16 warnings, and four items that have been ignored or said, hey, I've manually assessed this. This is not actually a problem. And and then this particular page has a 12th grade reading level, and we haven't included any sort of simplified summary to explain what is on the page at a lower reading level. Uh, this is a triple A guideline. So if you're trying to meet triple A, or if you are serving an audience where you know a lot of the public has a lower reading level, then, you know, like the CDC, for example, they try to keep all of their content at ninth grade or lower so that the average American can read it. Um, so depending upon what the website is, this kind of information can be really important for you. And so 
we would look at the summary, we would go to the details tab, and then we basically start working our way through the automated issues and trying to figure out, are these problems that actually need to be fixed or are they problems that are not actually an issue? Um, so we would look at, so for example, I've got um, that I have an incorrect heading order and I could click on this and I can expand it and I see the affected code snippet so for example, we have a heading six and there is the text of it is, here's what our clients say about us. If I'm not sure what this means, I can click the I and get more information about what incorrect heading order means. But basically I could then go up and find what, here's what our clients say about us. And I can see here's this, it's a heading six. This is flagged because the heading before it was not um, a heading five. <laughs> But really what we have to think about is this is in a, its own unique section and probably each section on the page semantically, it makes sense for the main heading to be a heading two. So in this particular instance, if you're just auditing, you might just note it and write it down and someone else would come and fix it. If it's your own website or you can, you're doing the content and you're doing the audit and you have the ability to change it, you might write here straight up, just change it, say, okay, this is supposed to be a heading two. So I'm gonna make it a heading two. Now it should be tagged as a heading two, which would mean that if I um, update my page with that as a heading two, and then I go down to my incorrect heading order, my problem is no longer there. So we try to work through getting all of these done first, because again, like let's resolve issues that we can do automatically, or sometimes we run the scan and then we hand off to um, a content and an initial developer and we say, you fix all these issues and we're gonna continue and do the manual audit. So when I do a manual audit, let me pull up my, a different window where I'm not logged in. So this is that I am now opening the same website in an incognito browser, just because that way I am not logged in. I am still in Chrome. Um, and actually, sorry, one second, let me go back for a second because I can't use my browser things, uh, my extensions. So, so one of the quick things that we like to do is a colorblind test. And I like to use for this, there's a free Chrome extension called, um, colorblindly. So if I click this and open, I then have the ability to flip through different colorblind tests and or different simulations of what it might look like. So I could go down and see, does this, so now there's a little bit of color contrast, which would come up in an automated scan. It would catch our color contrast and say, hey, this color of button doesn't work with white text. It needs to be darker. And we might notice that as well in our colorblind simulation. But we really want to look in the different versions. So this is somebody who can't see green. Um, what is what does this look like? And is it still legible? Can they still get all the information that they need to get? And and sort of do a quick visual scan on that side. Um, obviously, the the if you want to do color contrast checks, um, you can. You, typically, the bulk scanners will pick that up. Or you could do something, actually, let me put that back to normal. Um, flip this back to normal, okay. Um, or you could use Wave has a Chrome extension. Uh, we really like Axe, which it's a Chrome extension. And then what it does is it puts it in your dev tools. So I've right clicked on my site and clicked it inspect elements. And this opens the developer tools panel in my browser. And in the top menu for that developer tools panel, I'm gonna click this arrow to pointing to the right to see other options. I can then choose ax dev tools. And I can, nope, look, my renewal failed yesterday. <laughs> uh, so I won't be, I guess I'll have to check on that. But uh, so I can click scan my page and it will then show us the same items here. So I can see right here, elements must have sufficient color contrast. There's 60 things that it flagged. And if I scroll down in this box, let me 
Sorry, I'm like trying to move around all the pictures of everybody. Okay. I'm going to get. Where is that? Well, their heading has made it sort of hard. So I apologize because this is a little bit low on the page. But down at the bottom, I could actually see and I could ask it to highlight the particular issue if I wanted it to. So highlight in this instance, it's highlighted this button over here and it tells me the impact where it's found. Um, this is something that was found automatically, right? It, an automated scanner can find this. And then what the issue is, I can see the specific code, which this would also show up in my bulk scanning tools, and then it has recommendations for fixes. So um, again, Axe is a really great, super useful um, single page scanning tool that, you know, at, at times we'll say, we're going to run through this. We frequently, our developers will use this, use this while they're building out pages to test. Um, because it's helpful. It also has some guided testing that will walk you through some of the manual testing that you need to do. Um, but let me go back real quick and just do a quick demo. I know we're running a little long, short on time. So, uh, so basically, I'm going to show you real quick an example of keyboard, things I look for, and then also an example of a screen reader. So if I hit I've loaded this page. I'm going to hit tab key. The first thing I expect to see is a skip to content link. And this needs to meet color contrast and it needs to allow me if I either press my spacebar or my return key to jump down to the main content area. So where I'm going to expect this to go is right below the navigation into our hero section that says your best leading roofing service so that I can engage with the text and the buttons there. So I'm hitting enter and it's taking me, it says to the content, but I'm not sure where I am because it hasn't highlighted it. So this is something that you can really only tell if you're doing manual testing. I would ideally want to see some sort of focus date that shows me where I am. So I'm going to hit the tab key and just see where I went. Okay, so now I'm on this button. So I was in this section, but I didn't know it. So I would note that down as something I need to fix. Then I tabbed to the button and did it, is it obvious to me I'm on the button? Does it have an obvious focus state? The answer in this case is yes, because the hover is significantly different from both the background and the normal state of the button. So I'm gonna go to both of those. And then I'm just tabbing through the page in this instance and looking, so the same thing, there's a focus state on this field. Oh, look what I noticed. This doesn't have form labels that are visible. But in our automated scans, it didn't say it was missing form labels. So I'm just going to look at this to say, why did the automated scan not say it was missing a form label? So if I, again, right click inspect element, I can open the code on the page and I can go down through the HTML and I can see there is a label here. It's just whoever designed the website so it is accessible, a screen reader user would hear the correct label for this form field, but it fails because it needs to have a visible label. So again, this is something that an automated scan wouldn't pick up because from an HTML standpoint, it's correct. They don't know that, the, that there is CSS code that is hiding this visually on the page. Um, so, so that's kind of that big long list of things I ran through. Like you have to kind of think about that when you're manually testing, um, because again, like the automated scanners won't be helpful, but they won't get everything. So I want to go through this. I would actually submit this whole form. So I would fill it out, uh, type some stuff in here real quick. And then I'd say, okay, you know what? Message. I go down and, and I'm like, oh, hey, I'm on the button. I hit send. So what happens? Okay, it's submitted. It went there visually. I got it. I got the message. There might be some color contrast issues in that section that we would want to check, but you really want to go through and can you engage? Did it work um, just with your keyboard through the entire page? And then what you want to do once you've done that on the entire page is you want to do at least we like to do at least two screen readers. We do map on Max. We do voiceover, which I'm about to demo for you. 
And then on um, Windows, we'll do NVDA. Um, both are free. So I'm going to go in Mac to my accessibility. And this is installed on your Mac if you have one already. I'm going to go to VoiceOver. I'm going to enable VoiceOver. I'm going to have to pause a little bit while I'm doing some of this because it, um, it's, I don't want to try and talk over it because I know it's really hard to listen to the screen reader and me. So real quick, just so you know what I'm going to do is I am going to enable it. I'm going to come back here and I'm just going to show you an example with the navigation menu. Um, I'm going to go through it. I'll stop it from talking and I'll point something out to you. Voiceover on system preferences, accessibility window, accessibility features table, voiceover, Chrome, inaccessible websites example, link. Skip to content. Rent. City College of San Francisco window. CS student to everyone. You are currently on a late talk inside of Thank you. Another meeting to go to. Brent, City College of San Francisco CS student has left the meeting. Um, I will mention if you write in the chat, it's going to read it out. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to go quickly through the navigation menu and um, kind of highlight something for you. Current page, link, image, inaccessible website example, banner. You are currently on a link. To click this link, press Control, Option, Space. Okay, so uh, on that, you'll notice that it said link. Now in Seattle has left the meeting. Link image banner. That was this was the one that didn't have alternative text. So of course, this is a link to the home page um, throughout the website. So we want to make we would want to make sure that this says you know go to attab homepage. Right. So again, it's something that when we keyboard test, we don't know. We actually have to listen with the screen reader. Current page link home list five items. Link about us. Monica saying you are currently on a link. Thanks, Stephen. Click this link. Press Control Option Space. Okay. Um, I don't know if you guys heard that, but when I came over here, it said list five items. But you'll notice that there's actually um... zoom out. You zoom floating video Chrome inaccessible website example about us. There you go. There. Link. Okay. Skip to content. Sorry. Link. Image. Inaccessible website example. Site navigation. Navigation. Li Stop. Okay. Uh, so you'll notice that it actually said five items. Right now I'm focused on the whole thing. And the reason, and this is something to note, you wouldn't really know unless you really went into the code and looked at it. In this particular website, they've created home about us services. Glenn Walker to everyone. Your caption panel is only partially visible, partly off the screen you're sharing. Can you move it into view? Note and zoom that you can turn off alert notifications so it doesn't interrupt home. your screen reader demo. Page. Link. About us. Link. Services. Stop reading. Yeah, actually, I just realized I can't see that. Where is it? Oh, sorry about that. Um, so what they've done is they've built this menu with home, about us, services, projects, and contact us in the WordPress navigation menu. And then some themes do this. They have this area that they can add other things and they've added get a free estimate as a button there. And this is problematic because we really want people to know how many elements there are. Um, and there are actually six different places they could go in this navigation menu. Um, so we would say for them, hey, you need to move that into your navigation menu so that when they hear the number of items in the navigation, they hear the right number. Um, but basically, that's an example of us going through the website and listening for things that maybe, like from a keyboard perspective, this navigation menu works fine. Um, but if you don't listen to it with a screen reader, you might not hear that. So that's what I was saying, listening for things that seem strange or confusing. Like, why did it tell me there are only five items in the navigation when I know there are six? I can see there are six. Um, I know we're at time, so I am happy to answer any questions, or I could show a little bit more of screen reader testing for people who are curious about it. But I, I think like that's maybe a gist. I know it's like super. Monica saying to everyone, show more, please. Show more, please. Okay, let me go back to the home page. Uh... Link, current link, link, image, inaccessible website example, banner. Inaccessible. All right. Link. Skip to content. Current page. Link. Image. Inaccessible website example. Site navigation. Current page. Link. 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 Get a free estimate. Banner. You are currently on a link. To click this link, press Control Option Space. Link. Link. Name star. Full name star. Required invalid data. All right. So I'm going to 
I'm going to point something out and you'll notice the last time I filled out this form, I only put the a name and an email and a message. I didn't actually fill in the phone number or the subject. However, there's stars that says um, it's required. So that's something I would have noted, which is this is a problem with this form. The other thing, this particular form, the plugin that it's built, the way it's coded, and you can see on the screen, the last thing it said to me was it read name, full name. So it read name is the label that's hidden that we can't see. Full name is the placeholder text. It read that it's required, which is good. I mean, if it actually validated and, and did it correctly. Um, but it also read invalid data, edit text. And what that's doing, if we were to look at the code, is this particular form plugin, it actually loads before there's an error, it loads the error message on. And so the screen reader is reading out the error message. So you'll hear as I go to the next um, fields here that it's going to read the error message at the same time as you move through the fields. So that's another thing that like visually you don't see this as a problem, but when you're listening, you have to sort of realize, wait, why is it telling me invalid data the second I get to the field? Um, email star active email star required invalid data. Monica, it's time to everyone. Sorry. You currently, how do you bring up the gray caption panel? Oh, so in, um, so where it's showing me that, uh, that is just part of, it's a setting in voiceover that you can visually see what it's reading out. Um, I'm not certain if NVDA has um, the feature, but that's a, a setting in voiceover on a Mac. Glenn Walker to everyone. Can you demo the rotor navigation? I think VO plus U. Yeah. Uh, Typing echo menu for items. So wait, what was the shortcut for the headings? Sorry. Glenn Walker to everyone, left and right arrow. Yeah. Text attributes, do nothing. Typing echo, characters in word, punctuation. No Sorry. echo to everyone, their speech viewer for NVDA. Yeah, Um. to be, <laughs> sorry, I'm like, kind of rusty. I'm usually doing this in NVDA, so I'm a little rusty on what my shortcut, my shortcut is on a Mac to get up the headings um, to go through this. So Glenn might know. Because <laughs> um, I know I know Glenn from uh, IAAP. But uh, basically, Second. Nope. Stop adjusting punctuation. Do you control. You are currently you in the text field. To Glenn Walker, to everyone. You. Sorry, did I miss a question? Let me change my Zoom setting so it doesn't read everything out. Zoom meeting pop up menu, system dialog. You are currently on a menu item. To click, view full transcripts menu item. Voice over off. Uh, can I get my Zoom settings to not read out? Hold on. Glenn, you said you know how to do that. Do you remember how <laughs> to get Zoom not to read what's typed in the chat? Sorry, my microphone wasn't plugged in. Okay, no problem. <laughs> if you, just, do you have your settings? Do you have your settings up for Zoom already? The little dialogue. Yeah. Is there not a the tree view on the left side? Or is there accessibility down the bottom? You're on a Mac, so it may be a little bit different. Yeah. There we go. Screen reader alerts. Sorry guys, I should have turned these off before I started. All right. 
hopefully I have them all off now. And I think you already mentioned that in the voiceover settings on the Mac. Yeah, you, I can. You can turn on the captions panel. I think somebody was asking about that. Yeah, I can show you how to do that. Uh, let me reshare. Super handy. And that's on iOS as well for anybody who has an iPhone or an iPad. You can turn on the captions panel. Yeah. So again, I'm going to go to system preferences, um, voiceover. Also, if you're learning how to use it, there's a voiceover training, which obviously I need to because I couldn't remember what my shortcut for headings was. <laughs> um, I'm relatively new to Mac, you guys. So I was like debating whether I should get out a Windows machine to do this talk. <laughs> but I was like, I'm just going to do it. Um, but you should be able in your accessibility settings to. Hmm, Nope. Yep. I'm a bad, I'm a bad example about how to use Max and, and voiceover. Um, but where is it? Display? No. I don't know. I thought that there was maybe once I enable it. Voiceover on system preferences, accessibility window, accessibility features table, voiceover, selected as keyboard focus. You are currently on a table. To enter this table, press control option shift. Um, did I share my sound? but I didn't share my sound when I reshared. Um, so no, we can hear it. Okay, cool. If you click open voiceover utility, then you can do different settings. You can change the speed. Um, I will say if you do user testing, this is one thing that we always do is we ask them to turn down their screen reader speed because um, our we find that users that are use screen readers natively, they'll listen at three, four times speed. And if you're not used to hearing it that quickly, it can be hard for, at least for me. Um, and you can adjust things like verbosity. how verbose it is, how much it says, um, and visuals. visuals. So that adds, it can add extra, um, you might've noticed when it's turned on, it adds focus states around elements. So that's one reason why, um, so I think if we were on this page, you might have noticed there was like a black outline. Why we do our keyboard testing before we do our screen reader testing, because if you only turn on the screen reader and do your keyboard testing with the screen reader on, you might mistake the accessibility features your screen reader is adding for accessibility features that are on the website. Uh, so I think that that's really important. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I necessarily had a ton more that Voice I, over off. that I was going to say about screen reader testing. Um, I think it's really like moving through the website, hearing what it says, try trying to match it with what, you know, is visually there on the page. Um, and, and does it make sense? So it would be the same thing. If I, um, if I submit this form and you saw that it didn't take me to a different page as a confirmation. It reloaded this page and the message was there. When the page reloads, was my focus on that page and did it read out the message to me with the screen reader or did it just dump me back up at the top? Because then I wouldn't know what happened and I would be like, wait a minute, did my form submit? Was there a mistake? I'd have to go find it, right? So, so those sorts of things, if there's, um, if there's elements where you can click to see more and there's a list let's say filters on a e-commerce store and you can see five items and you click see more and then it will show you it'll load 10 more filters if you click that see more does it jump your focus back up to what the next one is so that nobody has to reverse tab on the page to move back up and see all the options that it's expanded for them um, so really just thinking about if I couldn't see this and I didn't know what was coming next, or I clicked a button, what would I expect to hear next? Um, and then basically we are, so I have in my slides, I have some notes on, um, some of the tools that we use or recommend. Um, I'm happy to answer any like specific questions that anybody has. I don't know. Um, and then also, I'll just note, if you're super into WordPress accessibility, if you don't mind me doing a little pitch, like we have a, I run the WordPress accessibility meetup and we meet twice a month. 
Um, we have live captions and ASL interpretation also. Um, so they work pretty well for, they should work pretty well for everybody. Um, and we have a bunch of talks that are like super specific to WordPress. Um, but what questions can I answer for people about testing or identifying problems? Maybe I'll stop sharing so I can see the chat also. I was gonna say before you stop sharing, sorry. <laughs> if you wanted, you had the voiceover utility window up and I think you had clicked on visuals. Yeah. And when you click on visuals, there's that middle tab, it's called panels and menus. And that's how you would turn on or off the captions panel. Yeah. By, somebody was, somebody so was by, asking about that. by default, it is on. Yeah, it should be on by default, right? Yeah. So if you're using it, um, yeah, visuals. Yeah. So visuals, panels, and menus, and that's the category. Yeah. yeah. So that that is on by default. I, besides in talks, that it's helpful. Um, we uh, we also find it very helpful in documenting issues for our developers because you can screenshot that and be like this is literally what it said to me instead of having to like listen and type it out um so that's helpful and then so to other... change the font size there too mm -hmm. for the panel yeah i think you also had a question about the voiceover training that's in uh the system preferences under accessibility and voiceover under the toggle yeah. there's the mm -hmm. training yep when you go to sorry my captions are in the way Okay, so when you click on the system preferences accessibility, and then you go to voiceover, open voiceover training, that will walk you through like some of the shortcuts and how to learn it. Um, I don't, I'm not sitting at my normal desk because it's late for us where we are, <laughs> but I actually have, because I'm new to Mac, I like printed out the shortcuts and I normally have it sitting on my desk uh, because it's helpful for me with getting used to a new screen reader because there's a lot and that's I think something that's really important to know too is that most screen reader users there's settings where you can have it read through the entire page but a lot of times if you think about the way we are we we don't read everything on a page when we're trying to find information we skip through we scan or skim so there are features built into screen readers that allow screen reader users to skim the content or quickly find what they're looking for. Um, so that's what I was mentioning that I, I wish I'd remembered so I could have demoed the heading shortcut because I know a lot of screen reader users use headings. And that's where when we're talking about, um, you know, making sure the headings are in the right order, they could hear all the headings on the page or they could um, say, read me the H2s. And it could read all of them. And then they could say, read me the H3s. And if it says there's no H3s, they might not even try to ask it to read H4s or H5s because they're going to assume it's built correctly. And if there's no H3s, then there's not going to be any H4s or H5s, right? Um, another way is like there's a shortcut to just read out all the links on a page. And so that's where they might hear, you know, get a free estimate, view our services, send, well, that's a button, so they wouldn't hear that. But then if they get down here, learn more. And if these don't have any sort of actual hidden text on them, so this button literally, it's its a link that's been styled as a button, literally just says learn more. They're going to get to this list of links and they're going to hear learn more, learn more, learn more, learn more. And they won't know where am I, what am I learning more about and why would I choose the second one instead of the first one. Um, and so so it's really, I think like it's it's not always that they're going to enter your page or even just hit the tab key all the time. I think a lot of people think that, you know, they just come and they just hit tab and just engage with the focusable elements. And I, I think what's more likely is they're gonna be doing things where they're searching for links if they're looking for something specific or they're searching for headings in order to jump to different content sections on the page. Yeah, with voiceover on, if you do control option and the letter U, that brings up the rotor and you can like do left and right arrows to go through headings or form controls or links or images and then up and down will go up and down that respective uh, component yeah. type. That's what it was. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. So 
Does anybody else have any thoughts about testing websites? Or things that are useful for you? Because I always appreciate getting to hear from other people as well um, about your processes. No. Oh, Glenn, thanks for sharing the link to the keyboard testing. This is awesome video. Um, and I know that a couple of people had to drop off. I know they were over. So thanks everyone for staying. Amber, this is great. I think we could have stayed here for another hour just talking about testing. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. I was like trying no, to- No, no, no. This is awesome. Stuff. This is this is really, really helpful. And I think that um, when you were seeing it, so kind of like demoing it is what takes it home. So thanks for, for sticking out with us and showing us how things work. Um, I will, uh, I know that we're over, so thanks for staying. Um, the rec we're gonna make sure that the recording will be up by end of the day tomorrow. And as Amber mentioned, you are welcome to, um, you know, follow up with her on, uh, she's active, I think on LinkedIn, uh, mm -hmm. or if not join her in our meetup group. Um, thanks everyone for being here today. And I'll oh. see you all, oh, sorry again. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say I put the link to my slides. Oh, perfect. If is interested in those? Um, oh yes. Can we add them? I'll actually add them to the recording. If that's okay. Okay. Yep. That's perfect. Fine. That's yeah. perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, your team. See you next time. Yep. Bye. Have a good night. Bye.